you know, why leave it to chance? I know that this is coming because there's one thing every human being has in common, and that's that we're aging. We age a little bit every day. And so we know we're going to go there. And why not plan in advance and make sure that those who love us and those who are surrounding us know what our plans are to make that a smooth transition for everybody. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Liz Craven, vice president of ProAd Media Incorporated, publisher of Sage Aging Elder Care Guide and host of Sage Aging Podcast. Today we're talking about the beginner's guide to caregiving. So, Liz, before we get into the episode, I'd like you to share a bit more information about your background with Sage Aging, how you started working in elder care, and what caregiving education and advocacy means to you. Sure. And first of all, thank you for having me as a guest on the show. I am always happy at any opportunity to help to educate caregivers um, who are just trying to make their way. So my own journey in caregiving began a long time ago. It was when I was engaged to my current husband, my first, last one and only. Um, We were, yes, we were just newly together and his grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So um, fast forward, we got married, her disease had progressed and his mom needed help in caring for her. So I moved in with my in-laws for a few months so that we could find our way to better care for Mabel. And along the way, we found a family care home. That was a great situation until Mabel fell and had to go to the hospital and needed rehab. And when she was released from the hospital, the only resource that we had to find the next level of care was a list of phone numbers. And um, to say that it was an overwhelming situation would be an understatement. We made our way through that. This was 30-something years ago, so it wasn't like you could just open up a Google search and see what was there. We had to actually beat the path and, you know, talk to the library and talk to people at church and others who had gone through it already. We called the state to find out what resources were available and what should we be looking for. And through that journey, we recognized very quickly that if we were having that issue, other families needed the same type of information. And so Born was Elder Care Guide. And we've been publishing for 29 years now, and we are very fortunate to have very solid support and be able to help a lot of people here in the Central Florida area. But even beyond, because we have a website, we have a podcast, and we make our tools available to anyone um, who might need them. So um, to say that that advocacy and education for caregivers is important to me um, would be a gross understatement. It is my life. It's my passion. It's the way I make a living. And it's the reason that I do everything that I do. Since this is a beginner's guide to caregiving, and I want to go back to the basics. For most listeners, what responsibilities should you prepare for as a caregiver physically, emotionally, but also monetarily? Sure. That is a very big question. So let's, and and I'm going to try to answer this in the best way possible, because the first thing we need to recognize is that every single family is different. So every caregiving experience will be different. Some caregivers are hands-on and they are in the home providing hands-on care for their loved one and doing all the things. Others are long distance caregivers, or maybe they're in the same community, but they live in a different home and perhaps they have in-home care aides coming in to assist or mom and dad are already still pretty independent and just need a little help with a few other things like financials and whatnot. So depending on what that situation is, that answer is going to be different, but let's kind of go over some of the basics. Physical. You definitely need to take inventory of mom and dad's situation. So are they able to um, get around the house safely? 
Do they have mobility issues? In that case, you need to take inventory of what needs to be done and what needs to be adjusted within the home. You can add grab bars, remove rugs. Um, there's a whole litany of things that you can look at, kind of like childproofing a home. You want to make sure that it's a safe space for your loved one to age. You want to also involve them in the process because this is their home and you want it to be comfortable for them. So from their perspective, that's what you need to be looking at physically and making sure that you put into place any aids that might be necessary to make the home safe for them, including extra lighting and things like that. Now, as from the caregiver's perspective, um, physically, it can be a really demanding job. If you are someone who will be providing hands-on care, you really need to assess your own skills. And that can be a little bit alarming and um, eye-opening. We all think that we're capable of doing everything until we're faced with a situation and we say, holy cow, I'm in over my head because we're talking about a lot of lifting and transferring when someone is not able to do that for themselves. Do they need assistance with bathing, with toileting and brushing their teeth? Are they able to prepare meals for themselves or is that something that you'll need to do as well? Because then you're also looking at the upkeep of the entire household falling just on your shoulders if they are unable to do these things for themselves. So when you break down the whole picture of what is required to get through the day for your individual situation, make a list of those things that mom and dad need help with. You might find that they're pretty manageable. You might find that you need to bring in someone to do the lawn, maybe someone to come and walk the dog a couple times a day or prepare meals. Whenever you figure out what that formula is for you, then the next step is to bring in the help that you need. Um, and, and it's really important to ask for help. A lot of caregivers try to do this by themselves impossible. You can't do it by yourself. <laughs> so get help from wherever you can, whether that's family, friends, neighbors, um, local churches, or you hire some assistants to come in. So that's physical, probably a longer answer than you're looking no, no, for, great. but there's so much to think about. <clears throat> so on the emotional side, gosh, is that a biggie? <laughs> and ideally people would start to talk about this long before there's a caregiving situation in place. Um, my kids, I, they're 30 and 29. We have had this discussion already. They know what that we want the situation to look like when we get older and need assistance, if we ever do. Um, so having conversations early, having conversations with the whole family will prevent some of the emotional things that might happen. Um, you may run into resistance. Your loved one may not want to talk to you about certain things because it's embarrassing. And who wants that role to flip? It's really hard for a parent to take a step back and say, okay, I'm going to let you be in charge now. I've been in charge of nurturing you and growing you your whole life. And I've been the answer person for you, the person you came to for advice. And now we have to switch places. That's really hard. And so emotionally, you're going to find yourself in some really deep conversations and you may um, come up against some resistance to that. If you do, I would say bringing in a third party is a really good idea to diffuse some of that and allow a bit of comfort for your loved one to talk about some of the things they may be a little embarrassed to talk to you about. Um, emotionally, you're going to go through from this end to this end um, all the emotions. There will be lots of ups and downs. It can be a beautifully rewarding emotional um, situation. It was for me and my mother you'll grow closer. For some others, maybe not so much, and it might not be a good idea for you to be the primary caregiver. So these are all things that you need to talk about in advance involving the entire family. Now, financially, that's a really big one, and it couldn't be any more broad as it relates to an answer because it depends on how someone has prepared for their retirement. If there's long-term care insurance in place, if they're a veteran and they qualify for aid and attendance, um, if they had a great pension plan or a 401k that they've been investing in for years, there's no problem. You're going to have everything that you need. That situation will be much easier. 
if you are someone who was not able to prepare for retirement and walks into this scenario with nothing, then you're going to have a, a number of situations to look at. If there are social programs to take advantage of, you'll have to investigate those first, and then you'll have to find out where the gap is. You know, what is the need and what do we have? What's the gap and how are we going to fill that gap? Um, Discussions with an elder law attorney are a really good idea when it comes to this because they can help you to determine what your assets are going to cover and to help you get qualified for Medicaid and other things that can help. So I hope that wasn't too broad or too much. No, no, no. It was perfect. <laughs> it was perfect. I am curious, though, as a follow-up question, <clears throat> you said that your sons are 29 and, and 30 or your kids. Daughters. I'm sorry, yeah. daughters. Your kids are 29 uh -huh. and 30. When did you guys start having this discussion about, you know, planning for long-term care for you and your husband? It was actually when my youngest daughter went away to college. Okay. And um, bless her heart, she, she is just so forward-thinking. She always has been and such a great kid. And we dropped her off at college. She went away. She was in Dallas at SMU and we were in Florida and I had just left her there. And that was so hard to do. And I think she was missing home too and missing mom and dad. And she calls me about a week later and she says, mom, you know, you'll never have to worry. And I said, oh, I'm not worried about you. You're such a great kid. I know you're going to make great decisions. And she said, no, 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 I mean you. You'll never have to worry about anything. And it was her way of telling me that if I ever needed help, that she was going to take care of me. And ah, talk about melting your mother's heart. I mean, we don't need her to do that. <laughs> and uh, But I'm very happy that she was thinking in terms of that, of her family and what she wanted to be and the role she wanted to play in our aging process. And so at that point, I decided it was a good time to share with her how we were preparing for our retirement and what we wanted that to look like. And so those conversations with she and my other daughter, who's a year old, a year and a half older than her, um, those are conversations that we have ongoing. It's not a conversation that stops because situations change and desires change and life experience changes you. And so those are some things that we continually talk about so that they know what we would want should anything ever happen. And on the flip side of that, we know what they would want if something were to happen to them, because let's face it, any one of us can walk out the door one day and have a tragic incident of some kind that will put us in a place where others need to care for us. You know, because you have so much experience in this industry and you're obviously a great example um, of somebody that's preparing for long-term care, could you give us a snapshot of kind of what your plan looks like? Um, but also you mentioned, you know, involving... Um, attorneys, elder care attorneys, and things like that. Is there, and, and you also talked about involving family. Is there anybody else that should be involved in the process of planning? You know, it depends on the person. If you have a relationship with a financial advisor, okay. for example, that's somebody who should be involved. You know, you would want them to be connected to the things that you're doing and your elder law attorney to be connected to those same things. So there would be some communication and collaboration there. Um, family, that's a given. Um, and the better prepared you are and the more communication that happens in advance of any situations coming into light, um, the better because family dynamics can be very interesting. And for some families, it's very detrimental mm -hmm. and can damage relationships forever. <clears throat> and so if there are Absolutely. conversations beforehand where the entire family knows what the plan is and what the desires and wishes are, there's less opportunity for those arguments and those um, conflicts to happen. And you might find during those conversations, there are certain family members that say, I, I just can't be involved in the day-to-day -day caregiving, may, you know, that would send my anxiety through the roof. Or I don't have a good relationship with mom and to be in that close proximity for that 
period of time would be detrimental to us both. It's okay to acknowledge that those situations exist and to make sure that you plan accordingly. Um, I would also say if you are a family of faith and you have a trusted advisor within the church or any other um, social organization that you tend to go to for things, that would be somebody to involve. If you are a family who is having trouble with communication, my advice would be to bring on a care manager, a life care manager or a geriatric care manager to assist in some of those conversations. Um, So those are the people I would say mainly. If you could pick one thing that you consider to be the most critical legal and financial consideration for caregivers to keep in mind, what would they be? Mm -hmm. Well, your entire estate plan, I would like to group that all into one. That's a lot of documents, but let's say the estate plan, but that one of the most important pieces of that estate plan is your advanced directives. Everybody should have that. Um, I don't care from the, from the age of 18 on, if you do not have advanced directives, you need to, you need to make sure that you take care of that because when you reach the age of 18, your parents can no longer just make decisions for you. And if you don't have your wishes spelled out, some things might happen that you wouldn't want. And so I would say that's probably the most important, but a very, very close second, if you're caring for aging parents would be a, um, power of attorney. And especially if you're in a situation where you are caring for uh, parents who might have dementia or Alzheimer's, if you don't have those documents in place before they become incapacitated, that creates a very large legal problem for you and a lot of red tape that you don't want to have to deal with. So putting those things in place early is really smart. Um, You can put qualifications in there. So if your loved one says, but, you know, I don't want to give away power of attorney right now, it can be uh, contingent on their own state of mind and whether or not they're capable of making decisions for themselves. It doesn't have to go into effect right now. So those are things I would say that people should be highly aware of and make sure that they have a sit down with an elder law attorney, not just an estate planner. Estate planners are amazing. They're great. But there are a lot of things that you need to think about that an elder law attorney is specifically trained to help you with. Um, So that's those would be the two documents I would say would be most important. Elder law attorneys, just to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying, they have a a understanding uh, and a knowledge base in a very complex and specialized industry, meaning long-term care. Uh, And so I think that's why it's so important to communicate with an elder law attorney. They understand just something as as significant as Medicaid, which is different mm-hmm. <laughs> in every single state. And I mean, just so many rabbit holes. So talking to one, I think was extremely important. It is. And that <laughs> that's the other part of the answer you had asked about financially. Mm-hmm. What should they be thinking about? First of all, you need to take inventory of what mom and dad have, what assets are available to use for their care. Um, and then if there are any assets at all, visit with an elder law attorney because you need to make sure that you don't create a situation where you are going through 100% of mom and dad's assets to care for one spouse and leaving the other one with nothing. Nothing. An elder law attorney can help structure that into a trust so that there's enough to take care of mom and dad through the end of both of their lives. So um, it's really important to talk to people who are educated and knowledgeable about those things. That's not my wheelhouse. I know who to send people to, but it's important to have those conversations. Don't let a consultation fee scare you away from doing that. It is a, an investment that's well worth making. What advice do you give people when you're talking to them about the long-term care space, about providing caregiving to a loved one, or maybe even to themselves, uh, people that are in need of caregiving? What do you? What advice do you give them about navigating our healthcare system and ensuring that the proper insurance, whether private or government funded, is utilized? That is another really big question. They're all big questions, aren't they? (laughs) They Um, It's, you know, the first thing is to 
understand what you already have. Um, there's no way to know if there's something better out there for you until you understand your needs and understand what you already have in place. That might require the help of an insurance agent, or if you are an older <laughs> adult looking at uh, Medicare plans, the Shine, uh, well, in Florida, it's called Shine, it's called SHIP all over the nation. Mm -hmm. And that is a program where volunteers will help you navigate through the Medicare system to determine which policy is right for you, because there are so many with so many different um, pros and cons. And depending on what your medications are and where your doctors are, one plan will outweigh another. And the only way to determine that is to sit down with somebody who can help you get through that. Um, if you're looking at veterans, Here's something that goes, I think, underutilized, and that's aid in attendance. A lot of veterans don't know that they qualify for benefits. So they have to have been um, in the service during an active time of war. Um, if they were, them and their spouse are eligible for benefits. That can mean the difference between being able to afford assisted living or in-home care and not. Um, so those are some things to really think about. But in, in the general sense, you're going to take inventory. What do we have? What are the needs? And how are we going to address the gap? Because most families will find that there is a gap to be addressed, unfortunately. And so that means that either somebody has to decide to stay home from work and be a full-time caregiver, or you have to supplement mom and dad's income to afford the type of care that you're looking for. And there's everything in between. Um, there are some social services available. Um, your local area agency on aging is the place to start looking for those. But we honestly don't live in a time where everything is just going to be taken care of. It's, it's something that w is going to cause hardship in the family if you haven't prepared for it in advance. So a um, lot of options out there. It just depends on your own situation and what you are able and willing to do. The theme that always comes out in these episodes is that planning, prior planning especially, is so important. So uh, important. And if you don't, you're going to be in, you're going to be kind of under the gun in a very tight window mm -hmm. of making a decision. And, and a lot of times, you know, you make the wrong decision um, in those crisis situations. So that's true. And some people, you know, some people get lucky. And sure. they have a wonderful, phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but I kind of am of that school of thought that, you know, why leave it to chance? Right. I know that this is coming because there's one thing every human being has in common, and that's that we're aging. Yeah. Yeah. We age a little bit every day. <clears throat> and so we know we're going to go there. And why not plan in advance and make sure that those who love us and those who are surrounding us know what our plans are to make that a smooth transition for everybody? So as someone that has worked their entire career to provide resources and support systems to caregivers and elder communities, what are your favorite resources or organizations both locally and nationally? Okay, that's a great question. I will start with the national ones. And I, I mentioned one just a moment ago, mm -hmm. and that's your local area agency on aging. There is an elder care locator online. You can go there and put your zip code in, and it will direct you to your local area agency on aging. And that's something every community in the United States has. That's your clearinghouse for any of the social programs and a lot of the local programs that, that are existent. There, that's where you're going to find them. So that's a great place to start. And that website, I wrote that down, is um, eldercare.acl.gov. Amazing. Um, that is my favorite, top of the list. Next, I would say if somebody is um, caring for somebody who has Alzheimer's or a related dementia, then ALS.org, ALZ.org. It's amazing. They have in-person and virtual support groups. They have a huge library of tools that you can tap into. Um, virtual things happening all the time. There's almost every day of the week something you can jump into virtually from around the country just to educate yourself or to network with others who are dealing with the same thing. So that's another favorite. Uh, Meals on Wheels. 
That's a great one because sometimes as a caregiver, you need just a little bit of help. Maybe you work a full-time job. You need some help get, making sure mom or dad has nutritious meals. An organization like Meals on Wheels can get you moving in the right direction that way. And another thing about a local organization like Meals on Wheels, they're, they're big. They're all over the place, but they're also going to be able to point you to some of the other resources that are local to your community solely. Um, so that's that's a really important organization. The Parkinson's Foundation is another one. And AARP, especially for active older adults who are kind of thinking, I... From this conversation, I think I probably should start pre-planning and I should start thinking about what comes next. AARP is a wealth of information. They have all kinds of activities that you can participate in now, but a lot of, a lot of information also about planning ahead and keeping you in the loop on what's happening, happening currently in the political spectrum as it relates to older adults. It's just a great place to find a lot of good information. So those are my favorites nationally. Locally, I encourage people to call your local chamber of commerce that's somebody that's going to be able to direct you to some of the local services and organizations that might be available. Another thing to do is to search your local churches online. Even if you have a home church, look for the church that has a really nice part of their website for older adults? Do they have a lot of activities going on? Um, are there field trips and things that you can attend or social hours or um, fellowship meals? If they're advertising those things on their website and they have a web page dedicated to that, you know that there's somebody there in that organization who will be able to connect you to additional local resources. So look for those people who are already active and engaged. And my advice to every caregiver is to find a person who you know is connected. So in my community, I'm that person for a lot of people. Everyone says, oh, call Liz. She'll know where to look. Because the thing is, even though I don't have every piece of information in my head, I know where to find it. You need one person who is skilled at finding the type of information you need, and you will never be left without the resources that are available. <clears throat> you know, you are a valuable asset to your community. Thank um, you. And, and, I, and I love the fact that you pointed out you need to find the Liz in your community. So mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. If someone does not see caregiving in their future or cannot undertake the responsibilities of care, what are their next steps to secure care? Thank you for asking that question. That's so important. I actually had a conversation with a caregiver just yesterday, and she said, I am perplexed. I don't know what to do because my mom should not be living independently anymore. Um, we're just in that time of life, but I know my relationship with her. I love her dearly more than anything. And I think she'd say the same about me, mm -hmm. but if we were to live under the same roof, it wouldn't be that way anymore. And I know that I can't be the primary day-to-day -day caregiver. I need to explore options so that I can stay her daughter and continue to love her for all of her days. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really, um, self-aware, which is great. You have to be self-aware as a caregiver. And what a gift to her mother and to her family on the whole that she didn't put them in a situation through obligation um, that that would make a nightmare situation for all of the rest of her mother's life over this caregiving situation. And so for her, what I said, you know, let's again, take inventory of assets. Where are we? Do we have the ability to pay for assisted living? And in their situation, the answer is yes. Good. And that's perfect. So for them, it's about finding the right fit, finding the right community for her mom, and then finding ways for her to plug in with her her mom in a way that allows them to maintain their family structure and gives her mom the independence she needs um, to live a happy life. If someone doesn't have access to that, the answer to the question is a lot harder. Um, you know, it's 
assisted living is really the only other option if you can't stay independently at home and you can't afford to bring in care. That's where you're looking to social services for benefits. And unfortunately, in Florida, there is not a lot of that. I don't know what it's like where you live, but access to funds for that type of care simply are not very accessible. So what that means is creating a situation where if you have to, it's as a last resort, even if it's not the best idea for your family, you still need to move your loved one in with you. You need to create a very networked support system for yourself. So let's say you have um, neighbors or friends, family friends that have been around for years. You create a situation where there's a schedule and maybe Mrs. Smith comes over and visits with mom for 30 minutes a week and plays cards or you know, somebody else comes and takes her to lunch once a month. Finding ways to give the caregiver the respite that they need during their time of caregiving is ideal. Um, that's a hard one, and it takes a lot of coordination. But if you really look to your community to see what's out there, there might be senior center day programs where mom could go and enjoy activities with others who are her own age and enjoy dances and lunches and all kinds of fun things to give the caregiver a little bit of time away so that they're not spending 100% of their time together and getting at each other's throats, you know, kind of. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no. And that's, yeah. <laughs> a, that's a big, that's a big part, um, that we, that we encounter often. So what if, let's just say they don't have, you know, access to, you know, a, a network within the community. Um, they didn't save, uh, or they didn't buy long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. And let's say that they don't qualify for Medicaid. What do people do in those types of situations? <laughs> the short answer is they struggle. Yeah. Um, and I hate, I hate that <laughs> I have to say that, but it's the truth. Um, the family has to step up. Yeah. There is no other option because there is no system in place in our society to simply take care of people. It is left to the family. So in that instance, you have to get creative. And now here are some things I have heard of people doing. If there is uh, maybe a, a local college in the area and there's a college uh, student looking for a place to live, there's the opportunity to have them rent a room in the home and be responsible for a Great few point. of the household things, you know, you know, the cleaning, the pulling mm -hmm. the garbage can up and down, maybe walking the dog, maybe just checking in on the parent. If they're fairly independent, a situation like that could work out very well. Obviously, there would have to be background checks and some due diligence on the part of the family. But if you get creative, you might find that that works. And you know that putting multiple people together who have needs in one household can also work. Yep. And, you know, similar to co-housing, it lets people people who have similar needs, um, take advantage of multiple sources of income to put together to pay for that type of care. So I think you're going to see a lot of that creative thinking moving forward because we simply don't have, um, the structure within our society right now to care for all of the people that are aging up. It's, it's a big deal. We don't have enough assisted living that's affordable. Um, we probably won't have enough nursing home beds when people get to that point in their lives. It's going to fall largely on people to take care of their loved ones in the home. And so the more tools that we can offer and the more tools we can be aware of, the better. So uh, studying what's available in your local community is your best defense against being just completely overwhelmed. Because if you can get some of the smaller pieces taken care of, even if you don't want to do it, but you have to take care of some of the larger things yourself, it'll be a little less overwhelming. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's your best advice for someone entering the long-term care industry as a patient, a caregiver, or an industry professional? Okay. That's a good one. And I think my answer will cover all of those people. Nice. The first thing is get organized. 
You have to be organized. You cannot walk through this stage of life with everything all over the place. So whether that's documents or getting your thoughts organized or your plan organized, um, getting organized enough as a professional to be able to lead the people that you're assisting to the right um, resources, just getting organized is important. Getting educated, educate yourself completely as much as you can, not just about your community and what's available there, but about your own condition or your loved one's condition. What does that look like a couple of years down the road? You know, here we are at the first stages of dementia and we know what that looks like and we know what to do there. What is that going to look like a couple of years down the road? Am I equipped to handle that or do I need to be looking for more? So getting educated and getting organized to me are the most important. And the third would be communication, communication with professionals that you are seeing, your doctors, um, your elder law attorney, your financial advisor, all of those people communicate wholly. Most importantly, communicate with your family and your loved ones who you will want on your care team at some point so that every Everybody is on the same page. Um, I would say those are probably the three most important things. <laughs>